1962, Scottish biologist Vero Wynne Edwards published a book entitled Animal Dispersion in Relation to Social Behavior. It was destined to be one of the most cited texts on evolution published in the 20th century. But unlike Darwin's opus a century before, Wynne Edwards' book became famous for being wrong. In Animal Dispersion, Wynne Edwards proposed that an animal's behavior is shaped by evolution to aid the survival and reproduction of its group. If many 20th century evolutionary theorists have been decidedly vague about the level at which natural selection operates, Wynne Edwards was very clear. For him, it operated at the level of the group. Wynne Edwards used this group selection theory to explain many aspects of animal social behavior, and it appeared to make a great deal of sense. Why else should songbirds give alarm calls to warn other members of their group that predators were present? Why else should the runt of a litter give up its life for its littermates? And why else should animals come together so frequently, from communal roosts to communal migrations, unless they were assessing the size of the population, and using this information to control breeding so as not to overexploit resources? Animals, unlike humans, when Edwards argued, help the survival of the group and the species by only breeding when times are right. When times are hard, the group as a whole holds back and therefore survives into future generations. In Wynne Edwards' eyes, animals had evolved to be truly self-sacrificing or altruistic. Such arguments make great intuitive sense and they appeal to our sense of fair play. Unfortunately, natural selection has nothing to say about fair play. It is merely the name given to describe the process by which some individuals are better able to pass on copies of their genes to future generations than are others. Imagine a group where everybody breeds only when it is good for the group, producing fewer offspring at times when food availability is low, for example. Now imagine an individual in that population which has a mutant gene that makes it attempt to produce as many offspring as possible, selfishly ignoring the greater good of the group. It is this selfish individual which is most likely to pass on its genes under such conditions, not the altruistic ones. In 1966, George Williams published a book on evolution called Adaptation and Natural Selection. In it, he showed that when animals do cooperate, it is almost always between close relatives. If animals were acting altruistically, to their kin, then they were really acting to promote copies of their own genes and relatives. If this is the case, then it is not real altruism, but ultimately selfish behavior from the point of view of the gene. Williams' argument drew upon the most clear-thinking evolutionary theorist of his day, and in bringing together their arguments and adding a few of his own, Adaptation and natural selection severely dented Wynne Edwards' notion of group selection. One of the foundation stones of Williams' argument was laid by another evolutionary theorist of the mid-1960s, Bill Hamilton. He proposed a theory of inclusive fitness, which revolutionized the very way that we look at the relationship between evolution and behavior. Hamilton, like Williams, held the view that selection worked on individuals. Clearly, individuals may help to increase the survival of their offspring by looking after them. You don't need to be an evolutionary theorist to notice that parental care is common throughout the animal kingdom. Animals, in effect, invest time and effort in raising their offspring because having surviving offspring is what natural selection is all about. What Hamilton did was simply to expand this argument to consider the way that animals might treat other relatives, since we share genes. Hamilton called the proportion of genes shared between two family members the coefficient of relatedness, or R. This value may vary from one to zero. Identical twins share all of their genes and have an R of one. Siblings and offspring have an R of 0.5. While for grandchildren, nephews and nieces, it is 0.25, and for cousins, only 0.125. Sharing on average 50% of our genes with each of our offspring, an act of heroism saving two children would save 100% of our genes. 
However, we also share 25% of our genes with each of our nephews, nieces, and grandchildren, and 12.5% with each of our cousins, and so on. Using this information, it becomes clear that there are now two ways in which an animal can aid the transfer of copies of its genes into the next generation. Directly via offspring or indirectly through giving aid to other relatives. If fitness had come to mean the number of surviving offspring an individual produced, Hamilton now added the number of other relatives that an individual helped to survive, each of which is weighted by its R to the equation to come up with the value he called inclusive fitness. This means that inclusive fitness is equal to the sum of direct and indirect fitness. Although today most evolutionary psychologists subscribe to individual or gene level selection theory, the notion of group selection is by no means dead and buried. A number of evolutionists have attempted to revive a form of group selectionism under the banner of multi-level selection theory. Multi-level selection is particularly associated with American evolutionists Elliot Sober and David Sloan Wilson. Multi-level selection is a complex theory that proposes that groups, in addition to individuals, might be considered to be vehicles in the language of Richard Dawkins. Although Sober and Wilson have sought to revive the group as a unit of selection, they do not propose that this replaces either gene or individual level selection, but rather that natural selection can act at all three levels. Drawing on both logical and empirical studies, Sober and Wilson argue that when individual group members cooperate, the group can then outcompete other groups in terms of reproductive success. What sets this apart from when Edwards' group selectionism is the recognition that gene and individual level selection also occur. This view is not without support from evolutionary psychologists and sociobiologists. E.O. Wilson, for example, has been favorable to multi-level selection theory. The gene-centered evolutionists such as Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett are yet to be convinced about multi-level selection, however. Multi-level selection may have kept the argument about the level of selection on the table, but it has a long way to go if it is to convince mainstream evolutionary psychologists. Due to its current standing in evolutionary psychology, in this book we adhere largely to the individual gene-centered view of the relationship between behavior and evolution. But not all examples of animals giving aid to others involve relatives. Among the primates, there are well-documented cases of individuals aiding non-kin. An example of this is that unrelated vervet monkeys, which form regular grooming pairs, will come to each other's aid in combat. Until this and other examples of altruism could be explained, group selection still had a foothold in evolutionary theory. In the early 1970s, a student of Hamilton by the name of Robert Trivers came up with an argument as to how non-relatives could engage in apparently altruistic acts without resorting to a group selection explanation. He called his idea reciprocal altruism. Reciprocal altruism might be likened to you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours, but it is just a little more complicated than this. In Triver's model, there are a few prerequisites. It is necessary for animals to live in quite stable groups, to be relatively long-lived, and to be capable of spotting cheats. It is also important that the cost of the altruistic act is low compared to the benefit. To quote Trivers, whenever the benefit of an altruistic act to the recipient is greater than the cost to the actor, then as long as the help is reciprocated at some later date, both participants will gain. Trivers' reciprocal altruism appears to work quite well for humans. Imagine, for example, that we are living on the plains of the Serengeti in Africa and that I have just killed a wildebeest. There is more meat than I could possibly eat before it either goes off in the heat of the African sun or is stolen by a clan of hungry hyenas. You may be starving, but I can save your life at very little cost by giving you meat that is left over when I've had my fill. A week later, our roles might easily be reversed, and you may then save my life with your meat. 
In this way, if individuals regularly meet each other and enter into such reciprocal arrangements, then we may all gain. Reciprocated acts of kindness are arguably one of the main features of human society, but isn't this asking rather a lot of animals? Just how common reciprocal altruism is in the animal kingdom has become an area of great debate in recent years. Furthermore, if aid is given when reciprocated aid is anticipated, is this really a form of altruism at all? We will explore both kin altruism and reciprocal altruism further. Now, let's join Richard Attenborough from the field, investigating vampire bats and their extreme altruism. Arguments and squabbles between adult animals striving to maintain their position within their community are common enough. But acts of assistance in which one adult animal goes to the aid of another that's got itself into difficulties, these are much rarer. But this sort of behavior does seem to occur regularly in one species of animal, a colony of which is living in this hollow tree. It's not an animal that might immediately come to mind as an example of a caring, unselfish creature. But that apparently is what it is. On this pile of droppings, there are flecks of congealed blood, characteristic sign of vampire bats. And the colony itself is roosting above me. These bats, or females, habitually roost as a group. If they move elsewhere, they will stick together and hang in the same sort of arrangement. Most are related, although by no means all, but every bat knows her regular companions well. At night, they fly off to look for blood. A donkey is a favorite target. One lands on its shoulder and shaves a slice of skin without the donkey even noticing. Another goes for its ear. The bat's saliva contains an ingredient that prevents blood from clotting and it flows freely from the wound they make. third bat tries a different point of attack. <coughs> the bat on the ground still hasn't got a hold but it's very hungry and it makes one last attempt. But no, she won't feed tonight. On returning to the roost, she hangs up beside an old friend. She turns to her neighbor and licks her face repeatedly, begging for food. If she goes hungry for more than a day or two, she will die. But her friend regurgitates enough life-giving blood to keep her going until the following day. On another night, the situation may be reversed and the bat that is receiving now will repay the gift if it's needed. But cheats, bats that refuse to give to a neighbor who once helped them will quickly be detected and in consequence may never be helped again. So for a vampire, it pays to help your neighbors whether they're related or not. Look after them, and they will look after you. How do you personally decide whether to help someone or not? What goes through your mind as you consider giving someone a gift or doing them a favor? There may be way more considerations than we are conscious of, but how many consideration points can you identify? Was one of your considerations whether they will reciprocate at a future time? Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, drew on the ideas of Williams, Hamilton, and Trivers, but it also made an original contribution to evolutionary theory. Whereas previous works had suggested that we should be focusing on genes if we want to explain behavior and physical traits, Dawkins explicitly proposed that the unit of selection is the gene itself. 
In order to explain his thesis, he introduced a number of new terms into the debate, in particular, the replicator and the vehicle. Replicators are any entities which are able to make copies of themselves, the genes. Vehicles are the organisms which, on a geological time scale, briefly carry the replicators. A gene which is a particularly good replicator may continue for an indeterminately long number of generations. While the vehicle may be considered a transient survival machine, the gene which is most selfish may in theory be immortal via copies of itself that it leaves. So selfish in this context merely means affecting the organism to make one's own replication likely with no purposive state intended. But why the selfish gene? When we talk about behaving selfishly, we are using purposive and emotive language. In the context of his theory, Dawkins uses the term selfish in a very specific way. Genes are considered selfish since alleles in the past which affected bodies to promote copies of themselves at the expense of others are the ones that are with us today. As Ridley has put it, given that genes are the replicating currency of natural selection, it is an inevitable algorithmic certainty that genes which cause behavior that enhances the survival of genes must thrive at the expense of genes that do not. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.